Great. Welcome, everybody, to uh, the mini analytics Moody's webinar that we have today. We're very excited to discuss the future of credit uh, and the work that we've collaborated on. So um, thank you all for joining. It looks like we still have a few people trickling in, but uh, we can get started. And then um, certainly a recording will be sent out to people following the webinar as well. So um, I'm lucky enough to be joined by two great guests today. Sarah Sachs is a data scientist on the ESG team at Amenity. Uh, she is the project manager and natural language processing model developer for the custom solution that we've developed with Moody's to identify those material ESG credit risks. Um, prior to joining Amenity, Sarah was an analyst at an Impact Investing Climate Fund, where she developed research for climate smart technologies, private debt, and verified emission reductions, in addition to supply chain network analysis. She holds a Master's of Science in Urban Informatics from the Center for Urban Studies and Science and Progress at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Um, and for Moody's, we have Matt Kuchak, who is a Assistant Vice President on the ESG team at Moody's Investor Services, where he advances the ratings agency's efforts to systematically and transparently incorporate ESG considerations into its ratings across the globe. He's one of the firm's leading experts on global sustainable debt markets and has authored uh, many more papers than I could I could describe in a brief bio and introduction. Um, he's a member of their ESG working group and is also a corporate social responsibility impact leader. Um, he's a frequent speaker at many different conferences, so we're very lucky to have him on with us. Um, welcome to you both. Um, you know, my role today is a moderator for the discussion. I also, with Sarah, work on the ESG team at Amenity, um, and I think we have a, a great conversation planned. You know, throughout the conversation, if you have any questions, I'd encourage you to put them into the chat. Um, you can send them to the organization organizers and panelists, um, and we'll work to incorporate those into uh, the discussion that we have as, as we move along. Um, and you know, I'd sort of like to start maybe with some of the punchlines here, and then we can work our way back into a little bit of the nitty gritty, if that sounds good to you, Sarah and Matt. So you know, maybe Matt, we can begin by um, discussing some of the, the conclusions of the report that Moody's authored. Sure, so um, thanks, Ben, and thanks, Amenity, for having me, and thanks, everyone, for joining today. Appreciate, uh, appreciate you listening in. Uh, so we worked with Amenity on a project to help us essentially identify uh, in our rating action announcements, uh, our press releases around, around credit ratings, uh, where ESG uh, factors were a material credit consideration. Uh, so we've got a, a very large set of press releases. It's nearly 8,000 press releases uh, we, we published last year just for private sector Entity, so it's a it's a lot of work to manually sift through and look for uh, ESG uh, as part of our credit ratings. Um, so we worked with Amenity to you know, use their natural language processing software as a way to help us identify where ESG um, showed up. So we start with essentially a and Sarah knows much more about the, the details of this than me, uh, but we start with a rule based um, textual way of looking. Uh, looking for ESG, and through a uh, countless iterations uh, of uh, human validation, we've really narrowed down the list um, to those where we believe ultimately that ESG was a material credit consideration. Um, so around, of our nearly 8,000 press releases for private sector entities, about 2,500 of those, so right around a third, um, ultimately cited ESG as one of the key um, you know, material credit considerations. That's not necessarily to say that the rating action taken and announced by that press release was driven by the ESG factor, but in our overall assessment of the credit for that entity, uh, we believe that ESG was a, a material consideration. So whether it's environmental, social, or governance, or potentially um, you know, accommodation or all three of those. Uh, of that 2,500 uh, PR uh, press release list, about 88% of those had governance as one of the, the key factors cited. Uh, about a fifth of those looked at social considerations and about 16-15% uh, looked at environmental considerations. Um, so not adding up to 100% because there could be multiple uh, ESG considerations cited. Um, and you know, ultimately, I think this um, you know, aligns with what we, what we think. That, uh, we're talking about materiality of ESG today. Governance is, is widely material um, to our ratings uh, and, and to our analysis. Um, and social and environmental factors, uh, you know, today don't always have a material impact. Uh, 
Uh, but we do think ultimately those um, those the materiality of environmental and social considerations uh, will grow over time. Great, and we're certainly going to uh, to get into some of those those weeds as the conversation progresses. I'm especially interested to hear some of your thoughts on the influence of the pandemic and amplifying some of those social considerations. So um, we'll definitely get there. But you know, maybe Sarah, picking on what he was saying around some of the context you can provide on the model. Can you give a high level overview of, of some of the work that you did to, to take the amenity ESG model and, and make it work for this project? Sure. So in order to extract these meaningful aspects of ESG, we started with these terms that, that Moody's uh, identified as being material to their credit considerations. Uh, so using these terms almost as an indication that something is, is significantly lying underneath, we use the amenity model to almost create like a probability that something else nearby is also material to extract and classify. Uh, so we had about 20 unique classification, uh, different essentially buckets for how we would identify environmental, social, and governance. Um, whether for the issuer being a private entity or a public entity, there were these unique differences in, in the contextual language that was being used to actually describe these risks. Uh, so through several layers of, of logic, we would use these terms to really understand the context of these terms in the greater in the greater meaning of that sentence of that paragraph and in the press release as a really a holistic understanding of what's being discussed and how it should be classified um, and working with Moody's to really understand and be in the mindset of, of how they would measure these risks. So we use the amenity model almost to augment where we should start looking when we train this model, and then we use the Moody's um, specific uh, logic to really understand where and how they would measure this type of risk. That's that's great context, and I think one of the one of the things that we've certainly seen recently is that you know, and we'll we'll get into this now. Actually, the ESG is in many ways it's sort of a new and, and at the same time not a new concept. It's it's an acronym that has referred to sustainability investing in many forms over the past decade. And one of the great things about natural language processing is that you can start looking over time to see how these analysts have been discussing these terms and, and even how that might have been changed more recently. So one of the things that I think is important to emphasize here is that um, amenity isn't sort of creating any ESG extractions. These are things that the Moody's analysts had been writing about uh, in many of their, their reports, and Moody's obviously has, has been on the forefront um, of incorporating sort of ESG into more of these rating decisions. So maybe on that note, Matt, you could give us a little bit of context on Moody's relationship to ESG and, and why it's been so important um, at, the, at the firm. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a good segue. And, and when we talk about ESG, a lot of, of, you know, how we think about ESG is not necessarily new. I mean, governance is material to essentially every credit rating that we've assigned over time. Um, and where there have been environmental and social factors that have been material to credit, um, those have been, uh, you know, part of our, of our credit rating consideration, our, our analysis and our research. Um, what has changed has been, as you mentioned, kind of this classification of ESG as a, as a group item, as a, as a new standalone item. And you know we've we've had over the last few years significant increase in, in market demand um, for us to be much more systematic, transparent, and, and open about how ESG factors um, you know relate to our credit ratings and ultimately drive them. So I think we've we've taken as a number of financial firms have we've taken quite a journey over the last uh, number of years to make ESG a more systematic. Um, you know, part of what we do and, and, and explain where it's already part uh, of our rating. So I, thinking back, I think the first, you know, major, one of the first major reports we put out was in 2015, uh, what we call our environmental heat map, which is our, our first attempt at looking at all the sectors that we rate across the globe, uh, something like 70 trillion of rated debt, uh, 80 or so sectors and really rank them based on their environmental exposure at the sector level. And that was put out before we had a formal ESG team. Um, that we ultimately started in 2017. Uh, we had a volunteer network before that. Essentially, now we, now we have a full-time dedicated ESG team uh, since 2017. Uh, and we've, we've had a number of different approaches to kind of um, walk through 
uh, and explain to the market how ESG is in our credit rating. So we've, we've published what we, uh, a cross-sector rating methodology that explains general principles for how ESG essentially manifests itself in our credit ratings. Uh, that's kind of the, the top level. Uh, as part of that, we, we've, we've uh, created, as Sarah referenced, a, a way of thinking about ESG through these different um, you know, 20 or so subcategories across environmental, social, and governance. Um, and sort of the next level down has been how we think about sector exposure. So I mentioned the environmental heat map. We've also published now a social heat map that ranks all of our rated sectors based on their exposure uh, to a variety of social risks. Um, we don't have a governance heat map because governance is always material. Um, so there's no real need to put out a, a sector heat map there. And, and kind of below that sector level approach, we've taken a much more um, you know, regimented and granular way of looking at issuer by issuer, um, you know, how ESG factors are material. Um, so now um, in our press releases and credit opinions, uh, we're being much more explicit and breaking out uh, in ESG sections where those considerations are material. Um, so part of the work we did with Amenity was a, a part of that process of helping to identify where ESG is material. And we haven't, um, you know, throughout 2019, we didn't have an ESG section uh, in our press releases. So it wasn't able to always just pull that out and say, here's where ESG is material. So we've had to use this keyword search uh, to essentially identify ESG. And we've also built some tools within the rating agency um, such as our carbon transition assessment, our corporate governance assessment, as a way uh, to rank order issuers um, around certain ESG risks that we think have high um, credit impact. So it's, it's been quite a process over the last, um, you know, four or five years to go from, you know, no, you know, sort of dedicated ESG section to really building out what do we mean by ESG, how are sectors exposed, and ultimately how are um, you know, issuers uh, at an individual level being impacted by ESG con considerations. Um, just drilling into what you're saying about sectors here, and we actually just got a, a question from the audience on um, sort of that sector materiality and if that's something that Moody's has developed in-house or if you're leveraging a framework like SASB. Um, you know, on that, I'd note that what we've been seeing in the market, especially with our off-the-shelf solutions, is that there's a lot of scores that can be out there. Um, and on the individual company level, you know, they, they might be useful, but they're much more powerful in context of either a company's time series or that peer group looking at a sector and really drilling in and seeing how these social factors are being discussed across peers. So um, just to answer that, that question for the audience, is that the heat maps that the Moody's has developed in-house or, or what's your approach there? So I think it's a combination of things. So with the, the sector heat maps, um, you know, essentially we, we identified for each of the, um, you know, various environmental and subcategories for each sector, um, you know, what is their exposure? So for, on the environmental side, for example, um, we look at, you know, for each sector, what is the exposure to carbon transition risk? What is the exposure to uh, water risk, physical climate risk? Uh, and that was essentially a bottom-up approach where we went out to, um, you know, the rating analysts across the globe uh, who are the experts in the sectors and know the material credit risks, um, you know, better than, you know, any one ESG analyst could. And we essentially um, go to them and say, you know, for the sector, where are some of the key environmental and social exposures from a risk perspective? Um, trying to think about what's material to credit uh, as we do that. And then we essentially ranked for each of those sectors, um, you know, for each of the subcategories and then an overall environmental and social approach, uh, you know, how uh, the sectors were exposed. Uh, so that was kind of a bottom up approach, leveraging the expertise of our roughly 1300 analysts across the globe. Um, for some of the individual scores across the specific risks. So we, we start with carbon transition risk because we already see for some sectors that that is a material risk that is having impact on credit ratings today or in the near future for some sectors. So there we're talking about coal, oil and gas, utilities, airlines, those sort of very uh, heavy carbon emitters. Um, we're starting there as a way to say, you know, how do we rank order these companies? Um, it's a combination of kind of our in-house uh, expertise around these entities alongside some third-party data providers um, that help us, you know, get, you know, consistent global data uh, ranking these companies. Uh, 
Uh, and then there's certain areas where you know, I think the risks are, are emerging, and we've we've made some investments outside of of Moody's, uh, which now part of the the Moody's family, um, to help us with those risks. So we've made majority uh, acquisitions of Vigio Iris, which is a, a company in Paris that has uh, a, nearly two decades of experience producing ESG scores, uh, and also. Uh, sustainable bond assessments and, and linking linkages to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we also have a majority interest in 427, uh, which is an outfit based in Berkeley, California, that focuses primarily on physical climate risk. Um, and, and with uh, both the physical climate side of, of 427, that's something that's you know an emerging risk that we're going to need to take closer looks at as physical risk becomes uh, a, a larger issue going forward. And, and Vigio Iris has a, a special focus on, on, on social risk. And it's an area that, uh, you know, where material, we factored it in. Uh, but ultimately, you know, getting some more consistent data that we can apply and, and thinking about how we fit that into our credit research. Uh, we, we've seen some need to make those investments to help bolster our expertise in-house. That makes sense. And I, I think risks is, is sort of a very key word, especially as we discuss fixed income. Um, you know, a lot of what, what we're seeing is uh, fixed income um, investors looking to help identify some of those tail end risks that may appear across their portfolio. And it's one of the places where you can really leverage more immediate data sets like natural language processing can create to flag some of those risks in, in real time before they might be incorporated into those, those traditional governance databases. And I think that the thought process around risks is... Um, you're relatively advanced. I'm sort of interested to hear uh, the flip side of that, some of the opportunities. Do you think that um, highlighting sort of some of the positive sentiment or positive implications uh, a company might be exposed to around carbon transition um, you know, gives companies a boost or is it really sort of more focused on that, on that negative right now? I mean, I think, um... You know, I, it, it's hard to generalize, but but yep. more it's more likely that that ESG considerations are are going to have a negative impact. We think there's 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 more downside risk with certain things. So if we think about physical climate risk, it's much easier to kind of point to some of the downsides that may occur over time as as um, sea level rise, more frequent storms, um, you know, increased drought conditions. It's much easier to point to some of the negatives that issuers are going to have to cope with than it is some of the positives. Uh, you mentioned carbon transition, and we've identified those sectors that are most exposed. Um, there could be some companies within those sectors that um, are potentially, uh, you know, benefiting from carbon transition. So if we think about the auto industry, uh, there's a risk for a number of companies that have, um, you know, pr predominantly gas-powered vehicles. Um, that are going to need to shift over time to, to battery and hybrid um, vehicles. And uh, we think about a company like Tesla, 100% um, electric vehicles, they actually potentially stand to benefit from carbon transition from a market perspective uh, because their fleet's actually well positioned vis-a-vis um, -vis their peers. So there are potential opportunities there. And when we talk about things like a, a heightened uh, focus on corporate reputation, um, and and how do corporates um, not only interact with their shareholders but also with their employees, their customers, and broader society? You know, companies that are able to clearly articulate and demonstrate um, that 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 societal responsibility potentially have upside uh, from a consumer demand perspective if if they're able to attract customers who care about that. And as we have sort of buying power and investing power shifting to millennials. Um, there is potential upside for companies that can kind of demonstrate um, their sustainability uh, credentials. So it's it's not necessarily all downside risk around ESG. There are opportunities, um, but we we have seen that there's a, a bit of a negative bias in terms of how it might manifest itself from a credit perspective. Hmm. Um, that makes sense. And and there's definitely a, a number of different considerations and different categories that that we sort of have mentioned in the conversation. So. I think it's probably a good time to, to take a step back and talk a little bit about how we how we modeled that. Um, so, you know, Matt and then and then Sarah, what I'd like to understand is a little bit around the methodology for um, grouping those different ESG considerations into into categories and um, how that process looked like at Moody's. I assume it was sort of consultative with different experts and, and analysts. 
Yeah, I mean, I think we've, you know, we've tried to identify um, as a way to, for us to help, you know, number one, explain to the market, what do we mean when we say ESG, you know, to really break out um, some key categories. So for environmental, we're looking at things like carbon transition risk, physical climate change, um, you know, biodiversity, natural capital, and, and kind of how do those things fit into a, a classification system. Um, similarly for social, you know, for, for public issuers, we're looking at education, housing, labor and income, um, thinking about segmenting those out. So we have a way to, to consistently explain um, to the market, what do we mean when we're talking about ESG? And then internally as well, you know, how do we um, make sure that we're being consistent and applying, um, you know, similar language? Um, so I think, you know, part of the challenge with, um, you know, the project to identify where ESG uh, is material in our rating action announcements has been um, sort of that language um, consideration and, and where we thought, you know, certain keywords might be clear indicators uh, of ESG. We've found some challenges with using simple text searches where we've, uh, you know, tried to work with amenity, um, you know, to really help us understand the sentence context and, and make sure that we weren't just pulling out a word like climate, which, you know, might be a good indicator of when we're talking about climate change, but we could be talking about the political climate or the economic climate. So we kind of need to build uh, a bit more context around how we think about this. Um, so, I mean, Sarah, if you want to maybe weigh in a bit on, on how you kind of you approached what we kind of dropped to you uh, to begin with and, and how you thought about making some tweaks there. Sure. So I think, you know, part of creating a highly tailored solution is really understanding what it is that the, the client is after. So initially, we actually looked at a lot of the, the research that Moody's has produced in their methodology to really, you know, get into that perspective of how an analyst would look at something like this. Um, so we initially just started with having some output and we would have this iterative approach in understanding when we might need to reclassify due to the context outside of that actual keyword itself. So, for example, if you're talking about something like the, um, you know, the demographic trends um, as, as a social risk, how this might actually also relate to the governance and how in this type of context, this would actually be more accurately, you know, addressing how they manage risk. Um, so really working closely uh, with these subject matter experts, such as, as Matt, to really understand how we can accurately classify it and then make that adjustment in the model um, through this iterative approach where we continuously expand the, the base of, of what we'd actually try to capture and ensure that the accuracy and the recall of, of throughout all of those thousands of press releases that we are, are capturing the, the material risk. Yeah, definitely what we've been we've been seeing in the market is sort of an increasing sophistication among different ESG investors. Moody's is you're the perfect example of an institution that has um, a, a, a lot of developed thought on what you now consider to be these material ESG factors. And once you're able to identify um, the the conceptions of materiality and what you're looking to capture, that's sort of our bread and butter to to take the context into account and make sure we're picking that up. Um, you know, and unsurprisingly, we came prepared with a couple of examples to to drive home that point. So I'll start sharing my screen, and maybe Sarah, you can. You can speak to uh, a little bit of what, what we have going on in this sentence. Sure. So part of our model, we have a full syntactic parse to really understand uh, what's going on here. So if you took a simple bag of words approach, as Matt mentioned around the word climate, um, this type of sentence has really uh, very little to do with anything relating to climate change risk. Uh, so this type of sentence would be deemed a false positive if we were to pick it up just based off the word climate. But because we have this full contextual understanding um, of this being a, a purely just descriptive aspect of, of a structural shift in, in policy around the economic climate, um, although maybe some of these words outside of that phrase economic climate might also indicate that this is something that's, that's meaningful. Um, but because we have this really high, um, you know, ability to indicate what what is actually being discussed we were able to exclude this as something that would get um, extracted in the model itself um, and we actually picked up a, a second example but if you don't mind scrolling down um, where even just the context of a term that that might seem that it would be material uh, really understanding the type of the language that we're dealing with um, as being text agnostic 
you know, the type of term pollution control um, would be material outside of this context, but because we understand that this is actually talking about the, the title of the, of the issuer itself, um, that this should not be considered as something that would relate to environmental risk as well. Yeah, I, I think that's important. And I think also, you know, the, the ability to do that sort of deep contextual analysis where we would treat the sentence and clause as that, as that feature and take that thematic approach to natural language processing, it has several knock-on benefits that actually means that the data set is, is very transparent. And especially when you start dealing with artificial intelligence and natural language processing, you can sort of lose a little bit of an understanding of um, what's underlying a given score. Um, but in this case, and in our off-the-shelf offerings, you know, any, any product that Amenity puts out into the world, you're going to be able to see the underlying detailed data where you can go in and read the extractions in context. Um, and in this case, Matt, that might have actually made a little bit more work for you given the uh, extractions that we sent you. But I was wondering if it was, if it was useful sort of once Amenity had pulled out some of those key sentences to then be able to read through in more of a structured content and, and context and, and read through those, those examples. Yeah, I think hundred uh, percent. I mean, I think we, we've had, I mean, Sarah, we've had how many countless back and forths on, <laughs> on some of the data set results, right? And I think you know, we take some examples um, have been, um, you know, we've learned quite a bit. So we thought, take governance, for example, um, you know, something like a, a financial strategy uh, and, and leverage policy is something that, um, you know, could be material for credit if there are significant changes uh, from a governance perspective. So I think, uh, and we started out talking about how leverage could be a potential, um, you know, key word to look for as a way to identify some of those governance um, changes that might be material to our credit analysis. And I uh, forget the exact numbers, but we, we, we returned, I guess, unsurprisingly, a, a very large number of private sector press releases um, that discussed leverage, and the vast majority of those weren't necessarily related um, to a governance consideration. So we were, if we're trying to really pick up where ESG is a material consideration on that point, um, we'd want to identify uh, circumstances where a, a change in governance around leverage policy or financial strategy, either to become more aggressive or, or more conservative, um, could be impacting how we're thinking about that credit. So we've had to, you know, very, very you know, carefully ensure that we're we're only picking up those instances where it's really a governance change that's leading to that change in in leverage or leverage policy, and not purely, um, you know, leverage changing for a vast uh, you know majority of reasons that aren't governance related. So I think through that back and forth process, um, you know, kind of presenting our initial thoughts of what could be good keywords to help identify how analysts talked about this seeing the results, seeing some of the, you know, the, the potentially very high number of what we would say are false positives, um, and then and then fine tuning the model to help us really identify those cases that we're, we're trying to say, yes, this is truly a governance issue. Um, it's been very helpful for us to have that back and forth and provide that nuance to the model um, that we could do if we were doing it manually, but it's hard to do in a systematic way with kind of simple text uh, searches. Yep. I, I think that sort of emphasis on systematic is important because being able to then run this over lots of documents to create that data set is is powerful. Um, but you know, it also does sort of raise a good point, and we just got a question from the audience around sort of the flexibility of these tools and how you can capture fast moving events and maybe add into the taxonomy. So your know, flexibility and that level of customization is something that we pride ourselves on being able to, um, you know, quickly turn around data sets that reflect uh, a whole sort of new world construct. Um, and, you know, this, this segues into uh, the recent COVID pandemic and a little bit of the influence that we've seen on, on ESG. So I'm curious, Matt, if you can explain how quickly that's uh, reflected in a rating um, and then a little bit about your thoughts on, on more of the larger meaning for ESG in, in context of COVID. Yeah, so maybe, you know, I'll... I'll talk a little bit about from sort of a modeling perspective, because uh, again, a lot of um, what we're looking at here is essentially press releases we've already published where the ESG opinion has kind of already been in there. It's the idea of identifying that. So I think we've had, you know, as we've done some some work on some of the recent press releases, uh, starting in, you know, more the end of Q1 and beginning of Q2, we've had to think about, um, you know, how do we update our keyword list to account for the new, 
um, and the, the new you know, challenge that is the coronavirus pandemic. So I think we've had some conversations there to make sure we're identifying that. Uh, and, and the key reason being that uh, the, pan, you know, the coronavirus pandemic is, a, is something we've classified as a social risk due to the health and safety implications. Uh, and then you know, identifying that as an ESG concern and then under, understanding some of the downstream effects. Um, so I think I'd, I'd separate the, the modeling side and identifying that from some of the credit impact. And um, when we talk about the credit impact, uh, of course, the, the pandemic um, has been a severe um, credit event. It's something uh, slightly unprecedented because you've had this health and safety crisis um, at, coupled with the, the oil shock uh, issues from a few months back. And it's created a, an extremely challenging macroeconomic environment. Uh, lockdowns and and uh, quarantines and such that have led to a, a significant change in how we, um, you know, the economic conditions for companies. So we've had a significant number of rating actions over the last few months to account for this changing, uh, this changing state of affairs. And uh, it's not necessarily the pandemic from the health and safety perspective affecting each issuer, but it's been essentially what that social risk from a health and safety perspective has caused from, an, from a macroeconomic uh, standpoint that's led to changing conditions for companies. Um, so it's something around 15 to 20% of non-financial corporates um, have had uh, rating downgrades as a result of the, the changing economic conditions, primarily centered around um, those companies that had already some precarious situations. So it's mostly um, the non-investment grade companies that have seen those rating changes, those that might have elevated leverage, less liquidity options, and, and weaker business models. Um, but it's something, you know, very quickly we've had to mobilize our analysts across the globe to really assess this impact. So we've tried to um, identify which sectors might be most exposed, and then within those sectors, um, you know, which issuers might be um, you know, most exposed from a credit perspective. Um, so I think we've had, you know, the, the credit side where we've seen significant change in, in credit conditions. Um, and then, you know, once we kind of establish that and write about it, how do we then identify, um, you know, where it's been the, the social risk that's driven some of this. So we've, we've seen a huge spike um, in, in, in press releases and, and our credit research that, that referenced ESG because ultimately this, this all started with a, what's, what, we, what we deem a social risk under our classification. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely something that we've also seen in the data where social risks and social factors are becoming um, much more discussed, you know, even to the point where we just did an analysis of, of earnings calls, um, mm -hmm. ran our ESG model and looked at how um, for the first time in, in this recent quarter, um, the social dimension had outpaced both environmental and governance. Uh, as the most talked about factor. Um, you're really driven by workplace safety concerns, um, some corporate philanthropy as well that had significant upticks in response to, to COVID. Um, and one of those interesting findings uh, in line with that analysis was that um, it wasn't just a, a increase in social, it actually traded off uh, on a conversation around environmental and governance issues. So we saw a decrease in the amount of, of focus that companies were putting on some of the work they'd been doing in clean tech or other environmental uh, environmental regulations. You know, moving forward, Matt, do you think that's more of, of a blip where we've sort of seen this um, increased focus on on social and then it'll sort of round out, or do you think um, you know that might be more persistent moving forward? It's a good question, and I think. Um... Historically, when we talk about the E, the S, and the G, you know, governance has always been relevant. I think it, environmental issues have been more top of mind, partially because they're a bit more tangible, uh, a bit more easy easy to measure the impact to date than, than the social issues. Um, we, like you said, we've definitely seen the same thing. Social issues have become significantly top of mind. Um, so whether it's sort of the corporate reputation perspective around um, you know, furloughing or firing workers, um, share repurchases in, in times like this. There's been a much greater lens on sort of the social uh, responsibility and, and social behaviors of companies in this crisis. We see obviously a lot of high profile instances of that being brought up. Um, from a, I do a lot of work on sort of the labeled debt side. So we talk about green social and sustainability bonds. 
uh, we've seen a huge surge in um, social and sustainability bonds, primarily from multilateral development banks um, that have been issuing these labeled instruments as a way to fund uh, pandemic response efforts. Uh, and, and we have seen a decline in green bonds. Now, I think that's more, um, more about the economic environment where we've seen a, a surge of, of borrowings from corporates who have been looking to get liquidity on the balance sheet, not necessarily tying those funds to, to specific projects, um, but we have seen that decline. So you know, I think short term, that focus will be much more on the social, just the necessity of the situation lends itself to that. Um, longer term, I think we're going to see a, a leveling out where it's not that social issues um, become the predominant thing, but it's, it's almost like social issues get into the front seat alongside environmental issues and it becomes you know, much more of a lasting impact and the environmental focus will remain. Uh, we've seen some governments when talking about pandemic response efforts actually link some of those responses to the, to the environmental side. Um, so there's a proposal uh, for a 750 billion dollar, 750 billion euro uh, re recovery plan in the EU, um, and companies applying for funds under that may need to disclose, you know, essentially how they're going to align their businesses with the European um, Green Deal that's proposed. Uh, in Canada, companies are going to um, need to report um, consistent with the task force for climate-related financial disclosures if they're going to be getting some. Um, bridge financing. Um, so we've seen this this recognition that it's an opportunity potentially for governments to think about recovery through a green lens. Um, and and you know similarly, we talk about these large global risks. Um, the World Economic Forum put puts out an annual global risk survey, uh, and there um, in, the, in the 2021 pre-pandemic had infectious diseases as only the the tenth. Um, you know, ranked risk in, in terms of, uh, I believe, severity. And it, the, the top of the list was almost all climate issues and environmental issues. So I, I, I don't think it's necessarily that environmental is going to go away. If anything, I think it's going to intensify the focus there uh, alongside now social risks being more top of mind than they were previously. I agree, that makes sense. Um, okay, well, we actually have, a, we have another question from the audience. Um, you know, Sarah, I'll, I'll throw this one to you, uh, given it has to do with, with AI. Um, so they're curious that, you know, given SEC Chairman Clayton's recent concerns that, that scores are imprecise, so looking across many different ESG vendors, um, until there is a standard tax taxonomy to capture the different criteria, uh, do you think that ratings will be less relied on or will AI be able to, to sort of bridge that gap in, as far as data sets? So starting with Sarah and then Matt, if you have thoughts on that as well, I'd, I'd welcome them. Sure, I think, uh, you know, inherent to trying to measure ESG is, is all the nuance aspects of how you actually would quantify this type of risk. Um, just from my understanding, if you were to ask five different experts, how would they measure ESG? I'm sure that you would come out with five different ways to actually measure that framework. Uh, so that being said, I think it would point light to how uh, valuable a tool like natural language processing really can be to actually quantify this almost nuanced and subjective context of, of a qualitative factor when it comes to uh, measuring this type of risk. So I would say going forward, um, especially when you can have this type of transparent uh, lens into what actually is being extracted when you have this structured data set and you can see why and, and how things were being classified uh, when it comes to this now a, a structured data set that you can use to measure um, in a systematic way uh, could be something that should be used for this comprehensive uh, lens into how you would look at environmental social governance. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in, in some ways it's, it's, it's inevitable that a more techno technology driven AI focus is going to, um, you know, be, be a bigger part of ESG as it is with almost everything that we do in, in the financial sector. Um, you know, I think it's interesting, Bennett, you mentioned the earnings call um, sort of analysis as a way to kind of think about, you know, sentiment and, and ESG issues. I think that's an, an interesting application. Uh, of sort of new technology and thinking about this. Um, you know, I think from a, from a credit perspective, we have a, a smaller 
subset of ESG than some, some of the traditional ESG scores out in the market that might not be credit focused look at. Um, I think a lot of those scores have been about kind of whether a company has a policy around something. So do they have a diversity policy? Do they have a human rights policy? Um, and that's not necessarily, you know, an indicator of outcomes, whether or not you have a policy doesn't always align with, with outcomes per se. So I could imagine there's going to be ways that, that ESG, um, you know, scores account for some more of this, um, you know, I would say new ways of thinking about and identifying, um, you know, potential ESG outcomes. So, yeah, I think you know, technology is going to transform a lot of, of what we do. It's just, it's a little early to say exactly what that's going to look like in the future state. I think going a step further there, if you just look at a sentence where someone's talking about a policy, but you can actually measure, did they define a, a quantitative goal and how they'll actually um, address that thing that they're just talking about. So something around like greenwashing, a company might have great, uh, like a PR firm that can talk about these things, but using something like natural language processing to scale, to actually measure what what is going on and how are they actually defining like an impact here, you can really start to compare these types of entities to understand how they are actually addressing something like ESG. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good that's point. A great, that's a great point. I think when we're when we're looking at things from a credit perspective, right, where we of course think about the policies that they have. And if you're talking about companies that have carbon emission reduction policies, um, you know, you have to kind of look beyond just whether they have a policy and whether they have a target. And ultimately, um, you know, how well positioned are they to hit that target? So when we when we have our carbon transition assessment, we're looking at essentially product mix, exposure to regulation, things that are much more sort of, um, you know, the fundamental makeup of the business as it res with respect to carbon than it is, you know, what is their long term carbon goal? Because it needs to be rooted in some of that um, current product mix or technological innovation. Um, so anything that kind of brings out the detail and, and the feasibility of those commitments, and it could be an AI solution, like you mentioned, would be um, obviously helpful for us to understand how we think about these things. Yeah, I'd add on um, to, to what you're saying that, you know, it's important to be able to identify that this is a statement around we're committed to ESG in, in a general sense, but is it followed up with a more specific uh, commitment or an action statement or a number in the sentence and those are all things that you can start to get at when you're when you're looking at context but i think you also have to be very careful and, and recognize that that pretty much everything out there has a bias so if we're looking at different types of text um you know amenity is relatively text agnostic so we now build esg models on lots of different types of, of self-side research on moody's press releases obviously um earnings calls sec filings news looking at the difference in sentiment maybe between a company's press releases and third-party media or you know, how focused are they on on these esg issues and talking about them in their earnings calls um, and we are seeing an increased focus on on making some commitments and talking about these issues in both more formal company channels as well as um, an increase in, in third-party media that's looking to hold them accountable so as long as you're cognizant of what the underlying data is um, and the solution that you're leveraging as far as, as AI is at least transparent into how a score is created and can give you some context into that underlying information. Um, I think that you know, there's an opportunity to sort of lean into some of the um, variety of different uh, ways to conceive ESG and, and try and find some opportunities and, and arbitrage in that uh, different sets of, of data that are out there. It, it'll be tough to standardize, but um, We'll, we'll have to wait and see, as I think Matt said, what the what the future holds. Um, so, you know, on that note, um, maybe we can actually get into a little bit as we uh, go into our last 10 minutes here, um, a little bit of a conversation of, of what we think about that future. So, you know, Matt, what do you, what do you think the future of ESG reporting looks like at, at Moody's? Is it going to increase importance? You know, it seems like the answer might be yes, based off of, of everything that we've discussed so far. Yeah, I think, um, you know, we expect that that ESG issues will, um, you know, intensify from a from a credit materiality standpoint. Um, so there's obviously some things that have been um, already part of the story. 
um, others will will gradually grow with importance. So in, in some ways, carbon transition risk um, you know is here, but it's also going to uh, accelerate and change for for different sectors, different regions. Um, physical climate risk, obviously, we that's it, we we've seen some. Um, you know, increase in temperatures and an increase in, in, in difficult uh, environmental outcomes uh, that's likely to intensify over time as well. Um, similarly, with social risks, I think there's, you know, as we talked about with the pandemic experience, um, there will be an, an intensifying focus on, on social considerations. Um, you know, more, more and more companies are, are shifting from this sense of uh, shareholder primacy to needing to deal with stakeholders across the spectrum, uh, whether it's their employees, their customers, um, their, their, their governments, their regulators, or broader society. I think that's going to intensify over time. Um, and you know, we've seen a huge shift in focus from the investor community to, to integrate ESG in their processes more. Um, so whether that's using ESG as a credit research tool um, as part of their, their process or building out dedicated um, you know, ESG funds, whether it's only investing in green bonds or only investing in, in companies that meet a certain, um, you know, ESG threshold, um, those products are going to be growing in number, which just leads to the importance for, for companies to focus on these issues. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, this is only going to increase in, in terms of how the financial sector is thinking about it, but also from a credit materiality standpoint. Um, so we'll, you know, from our perspective, we're going to look to continue to find ways to, you know, be much more systematic and transparent about how we're thinking about ESG. Um, so we've, I'd say we're still, you know, we've, we've come a long way, but we're still, um, you know, still evolving that approach and looking to, to respond to market demand to be more transparent. Um, so such as the project we worked on here of kind of identifying where ESG has been material, I think we'll continue to look for ways to, to identify that and then provide greater uh, granularity and focus on some of the emerging risks uh, with, with the tools that we build over time. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, you know, focusing on the transparency, one of the interesting things that we were actually discussing uh, prior to this call was one of the unexpected benefits of, of some of the work that we had done, being able to identify some of the language that different Moody's analysts have been using um, and the variety of language used to describe some of these, these concepts. Um, can you maybe discuss that just a little? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it's, it's interesting when we kind of look at all these um, press releases um, lined up uh, and, and kind of say if we're just looking at one specific ESG consideration, um, we can describe that using a lot of different uh, words that are, you know, synonyms for one another, but are, are slightly different. So I think, you know, where we see um, examples of potentially harmonizing some of the language just to be you know, make sure we're being consistent um, we'll, we'll look to bring that in and I think um, you know ultimately our goal is to make sure that that you know as with our credit ratings our credit ratings mean the same thing across the globe and across sectors um, we just need to as much as we can uh, you know transparently and consistently explain risks in a similar way so I don't I don't think we have wide divergences in how we do that um, where we find ways that we can just, you know, make sure we're being, um, you know, careful about word choice and being consistent in our press releases, um, you know, we'll, we'll certainly look to do that. And I think we were able to find some of those examples through this process. Yeah, agreed. Um, Sarah, do you have any, have any thoughts? You know, I think that Matt's point there sort of speaks to a lot of what we've been discussing around um, the benefits of of having that underlying data, but also sort of some of the tricky parts of dealing with text because you can sort of get at the same concept uh, a variety of different ways. So where do you see natural language processing and, um, you know, to the question asked prior, AI sort of growing in order to continue to bridge some of those gaps? Yeah, I think echoing off uh, some of the points we've been discussing, um, but a little bit differently, I see two sides of the same coin for ESG. You kind of have the impact side and you have the risk side. And I'd say, you know, ESG is an inherent risk in, in business operations um, and really being able to actually quantify it using natural language processing, I think is a pretty powerful approach when it comes to comparing these different types of, of processes and, and risk management strategies. Um, so I guess some of the, the challenges would be around 
um, addressing some of the biases perhaps in, in how the language is being is being used um, and really kind of being cognizant of, of what you're looking to measure and, and how we're quantifying this type of language itself. Um, but it's been kind of very interesting to really understand this type of perspective from Moody's where this language, um, whenever I'm reading out even just the news, you know, comes to mind some of the different topics that would come to light where we would perhaps classify just in the news right now about these different, you know, social risks around labor and income uh, as we're reading the news. So I'm just curious when it comes to how we can apply um, these types of models on different types of, of documents uh, to really be able to, you know, augment this type of, of ability to measure something so, so nuanced and subjective. Yep. No, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of potential to build really interesting data sets. You know, I think um, the example that, that fed into this report is, you know, the, the, the sort of quintessential example of how you can leverage a technology like ours to, you know, make some iterations on a, on a um, you know, model that we've developed to really get it to fit that, um, you know, sophisticated idea of what, what ESG means to you at, at Moody's um, and look at it on, on several different document types. So, I think there's a, a lot of room there to, to continue to explore. Um, and, you know, it's sort of limited by the ideas and the, the text that's out there. So, you know, from our side at Amenity, if anybody on the webinar, you know, certainly wants to learn more about uh, this project, about our ESG capabilities, whether that's off the shelf or more in the custom category, um, I definitely invite you to, to reach out. And then, Matt, I know that, you know, for people that are, are looking to the credit rating agencies for some of that thought leadership on, on ESG. Um, Moody's has a, a number of things in the pipeline and on a website, I believe, where, where we can go to read more. Yeah, we, we have a, what we call our ESG and Climate Hub. It's at esg.moody's.io. Um, and it's a, a good summary of a lot of the, the different initiatives we have on, on ESG and climate risk. Um, there's some of our, our research up there. There's some of the research from our affiliates, Vigio Iris and 427. So I think it's a good summary. It's only a, a small fraction of the work we've done and, and everything today seems to be ESG with the, the coronavirus effects. Um, but I think that's a good starting place and you know, I'm happy to uh, you know, talk to anyone who wants to know a little bit more about some of our research and um, some of the initiatives that we have underway. Great. Well, I think that's a, a good place to, to wrap up the conversation. You know, I, I thank you both for um, your thoughts. I thought it was really interesting. I appreciated the, the questions from the audience, you know, unsurprisingly, sort of right on point with what we were, uh, what we were expecting and, and hoping for. Um, so yeah, you know, I think if anyone has any closing thoughts, Sarah, Matt, um, we, can, we can wrap this up. No, I think we covered a lot today. I think we did as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you again, everyone, for joining and uh, look forward to, to future conversations um, with Amenities' work and, and with Moody's work in this you know, increasingly important space. Great. Thank you both. Thanks, everyone.